Chapter 8, Love. When Lewis's father and mother discovered that Lewis was missing, they felt awful. No other young swan had disappeared from the lake, only Lewis. The question now arises, said the cob to his wife, whether or not I should go and look for our son. I am disinclined to leave these attractive lakes now, in the fall of the year, with winter coming on. I have, in fact, been looking forward to this time of serenity and peace in the society of other waterfowl. I like the life here, after all. There's another little matter to consider, with the, other than your personal comfort, said his wife. Has it occurred to you that we have no idea which direction Lewis went when he left? You'll know whether he went any more than I do. If we were to start looking for him, which way would you fly? Well, replied the cob, in the last analysis, I believe I would go south. What do you mean, in the last analysis? said the swan impatiently. You haven't analyzed anything. Why do you say, in the last analysis? And why do you pick south as a way to go looking for Lewis? There are other directions. There are north and east and west. There's northeast, southeast, southwest, northwest. True, replied the cob. And there are all those in between directions. North, northeast, east, southeast, west, southwest. There's north by east and east by north. There's south by southeast, a half east, and there's west by north, a half north. The directions for a young swan could start off in are almost numerous, too numerous to think about. So it was decided that no search would be made. We'll just wait here and see what happens, said the cob. I'm sure Lewis will return in the fullness of time. Months went by. Winter came and in the red rock lakes. The nights were long and dark and cold. The days were short and bright and cold. Sometimes the wind blew, but the swans and the geese and the ducks were safe and happy. The warm spring that fed the lakes kept the ice from covering them, and there were always open places. There were plenty of food. Sometimes a man would arrive with a bag of grain and spread the grain where the birds could get to it. Spring followed winter, summer followed spring. A year went by and there was springtime again. Still, no sign of Lewis. Then one morning when Lewis's grown-up brothers were playing a game of water polo, one of them looked up and saw a swan approaching the sky. Kahoo! cried the cygnet. He rushed to his father and mother. Look, look, look. All the waterfowl in the lake turned and gazed at the approaching swan. The swan circled in the sky. It's Lewis, said the cob. But what is this peculiar little object hanging around his neck by a string? What is that? Wait and see, said his wife. Maybe it's a gift. Lewis looked around from the sky and spotted what looked like his family. When he was sure, he glided down and skidded to a stop. His mother rushed up and embraced him. His father arched his neck gracefully and raised his wings in greeting. Everyone shouted, Kahoo! And everyone said, Welcome back, Lewis. His family was overjoyed. He had been gone for a year and a half, almost 18 months. He looked older and handsomer. His feathers were pure white now instead of dirty gray. Hanging by a cord around his neck was a small slate. Attached to the slate by a piece of string was a white chalk pencil. When the family greetings were over, Lewis seized the chalk in his bill and wrote, Hi there! On the slate, he held the slate out eagerly for all to see. The cob stared at it. The mother swan stared and stared. The seagulls stared at it. They just stared and stared. Words on the slate meant nothing to them. They couldn't read. None of the other members of his family had ever seen a slate before or a piece of chalk. Lewis's attempt to greet his family was a failure. He felt as though he had wasted a year and a half by going to school and learning to write. He felt keenly disappointed. And of course, he was unable to speak. The words in his slate were all he could offer by the way of a greeting. Lewis, my son, he began. Finally, his father, the cop, spoke up. Lewis, my son, he began in his deep, resonant voice. This is the day we have been awaiting, the day of your return to our sanctuary to the Red Rock Lakes. No one can imagine the extent of our joy or our depth of our emotion by seeing you again. You have been absent from our midst for so long in lands we knew not of and pursuits we can only guess of. How good is it to see your countenance again? We hope you have enjoyed good health during your long absence in lands we know not of and pursuits we can only guess at. You've said that already once, said the wife. You're repeating yourself. Lewis must be tired after his trip, no matter where he's been or what he's been up to. Very true, said the cob. But I must prolong my welcoming remarks a bit longer, for my curiosity is aroused by that odd little object Lewis is wearing around his neck and the strange symbols he has placed upon it by rubbing that white thing up and down and leaving those marks of strange white tracing. 
Well, said Lewis's mother, we're all uninterested in it naturally, but Lewis can't explain it because he's defective and can't talk, so we'll just have to forget our curiosity for the moment and let Lewis take a bath and have dinner. Everyone agreed that this was a good idea. Lewis swam to the shore, placed his sleigh on the chalk pencil under the brush, and took a bath. When he was through, he dipped the end of one wing into the water and sorrowfully, so, sorrowfully rubbed out the words, Hi there! Then he hung the slate around his neck again. It felt good to be home with his family, and his family had increased during the months he had been away with Sam Beaver at school. There were now six new seagulls. Lewis's father and mother had spent the summer trip to Canada, and while there they had nested and hatched six little seagulls, and in the fall they had all joined up again in the Red Rock Lakes of Montana. One day, soon after Lewis's Lewis returned, the grain man stopped by with a sack of grain. Lewis saw him and swam over. Then the man spread the grain on the ground to feed the birds. Lewis took off his slate and wrote, Thank you very much. He held the slate up in the, to the man, who appeared surprised. Say, said the man, you're quite a bird. Where did you learn to write? Lewis erased the slate and wrote, At school. School, said the grain man. What school? Public school, wrote Lewis. Miss Hick Hammerbotham taught me. Never heard of her, said the grain man, but she must be a darn good teacher. She is, wrote Lewis. He was overjoyed to be carrying on a conversation with a stranger. He realized that even though the slate was no help with other birds, it was going to help him with other people because people could read. This made him feel a whole lot better. Sam Beaver had given Lewis the slate as a goodbye present when he left the ranch. Sam had brought the slate and the chalk pencil with money he had saved. Lewis decided he would always carry them with him, no matter where he was and where he went in the world. The grain man wondered whether he had been dreaming or whether he had really been a white swan writing words on a slate. He decided not to say anything to anyone for fear people might think he was crazy in the head. For birds, spring is the time to find a mate. The warm, sweet airs of spring air stir strange feelings in young swans. The males begin to notice the females. They show off all in front of them. The females begin to notice the males too, but they pretend they're not noticing anything at all. They act very coy. Lewis felt so queer one day he knew he must be in love, and he knew which bird he was in love with. Whenever he swam past her, he could feel his heart beat faster, and his mind was full of thoughts of love and desire. He thought if he had ever seen such a beautiful female swan, she was a trifle smaller than the others, and she seemed to have a more graceful neck and more attractive way than all the other friends on the lake. Her name was Serena. He wished he could do something to attract her attention. He wandered for his mate, but he was unable to tell her so, because so, he couldn't make a sound. He swam in circles around her and pumped his neck up and down and made a great show of diving and staying down to prove he could hold his breath longer than any other bird. But the little female paid no attention to Lewis's antics. She pretended he didn't exist. When Lewis's mother found out that Lewis was courting a young female, she hid behind some bulrushes and watched what was going on. She could tell that he was in love by the way he acted and she saw that he was having no success. Once in desperation, Lewis swam up to Serena, his beloved, and made a bow. His slate, as usual, was around his neck. Taking the chalk pencil in his mouth, he wrote, I love you, on the slate, and showed it to her. She stared at it for a moment, then swam away. She didn't know how to read. And although she rather liked the looks of the young cob who had something hanging around his neck, she couldn't really get interested in a bird that was unable to say anything. A trumpeter swan that couldn't trumpet was a bust as far as she was concerned. When Lewis's father saw that he went to the husband, the cob, I have news for you, she said. Your son Lewis is in love, and the swan of his choice, the female of his desiring, pays no attention to him. It's just as I predicted. Lewis won't be able to get a mate because he has no voice. The snippy little female he's chasing. After goes into a pain in the neck the way she acts, but just the same, I'm sorry for Lewis. He thinks he's the greatest thing on the lake, and he can't say, Kahoo, I love you, and that's what she's waiting to hear. Why, this is terrible news, said the cob, news of the most serious import. I know what it must be like to be in love. Well, do I remember how painful love can be, how exciting and to the event of unsuccessful, how disappointing and doleful the days and nights. But I am Lewis's father, and I'm not going to take the situation lying down. I shall act. Lewis is a trumpeter swan, noblest of all the waterfowl. He is gay, cheerful, strong, powerful, lusty, good, brave, handsome, reliable, trustworthy, a great flyer, a tremendous swimmer, fearless, patient, loyal, true, ambitious, desirous. Just a minute, said his wife. 
You'll need to tell me all these things. The point is, what are you going to do to help Lewis get himself a mate? I'm leading up to that my very own graceful way, replied the cob. You say that this young female wants to hear Lewis say, Cahoo, I love you. That's right. Then she shall hear it, exclaimed the cob. There, I hear their devices made by men, horns, trumpets, musical instruments of all sorts. These devices are capable of producing sounds similar in the wild sound of the trumpeting. I shall begin a search for such a device, and if I have to go to the ends of the earth to find a trumpet for our young son, I, find, I shall find it at last and bring it home to Lewis. Well, if I may make a suggestion, says wife, don't go to the ends of the earth. Go to Billings, Montana. It's closer. Very well, I'll go to Billings. I shall look for the trumpet of Billings, and now, without further ado, I go, for there is no time to lose. Springtime doesn't last forever. Spring is fleeting. Every minute counts. I'm leaving the instant for Billings, Montana, to a great city steaming with life and with objects made by man. Goodbye, my love. I shall return. What are you going to use for money? asked his practical wife. Trumpets cost money. Leave that to me, replied the cob, and with that he took off into the air. He climbed steeply like a jet plane, then leveled off, flying high and fast toward the southeast, northeast. His wife watched him until he was no longer in sight. What a swan, she murmured. I just hope he knows what he is doing. I hope you enjoyed this reading of chapter 8, The Trumpet of the Swans. And in the background you see Billy and Sugar and Butterscotch and my horse Toby. And they wish that you have a great time reading this book.